Coming up, novels featuring stories about Native Americans set in contemporary times. We'll talk to three authors about what it takes to create those worlds. Plus, from New Zealand, Canada, and the U.S., we'll take one more look at the indigenous athletes who competed in the Tokyo Olympics. I'm Patty Thalohunga. Join us for those interviews, plus headlines from Indian Country Today. The Walter Cronkite School of Journalism and Mass Communication at Arizona State University is honored to be a supporter of Indian Country Today. ASU offers the only online undergraduate digital media literacy degree, teaching students how to recognize and combat inaccuracies on all platforms. They are using cutting edge tools and tactics to separate fact from fiction in a digital world overloaded with misinformation. Learn more at cronkite.asu.edu. is Indian Country Today. Esquili, yes, eh. Thank you for joining us. I'm Patty Thalohungva. The Northern Cheyenne Tribe in Montana is under a state of emergency due to wildfires. Two fires are uncontained. The Lame Deer and Richard Springs wildland fires have devastated land, businesses, homes, and wildlife. As of mid-August, the fires have burned nearly 170,000 acres and are continuing to grow. Currently, both fires are at 0% contained and have destroyed power lines, which have caused outages. About 500 people from that area have also taken refuge in shelters set up by the Red Cross. The tribal government is requesting all aid to help citizens displaced by the wildfires. The head of the U.S. Energy Department is visiting New Mexico to promote renewable energy initiatives. Energy Secretary Jennifer Granholm is meeting with local leaders and organizations. The state is pushing for more renewable energy and efforts to lower costs. Over the next two decades, utilities must provide emissions-free electricity to customers across the state. One of the many roundtable discussions will focus on creating opportunities for local workforce. The region is preparing for the closure of two major coal-fired power plants and the mines that feed them. Well, you've probably heard the saying, it takes money to make money, and it's true. That's where, in some cases, venture capital firms come in. Alia Chavez introduces us to one such company that's native-owned and has been in the business for 13 years. After a career as an investment banker, Cameron Newton opened up his own venture capital firm. It was a bold move to make in 2008. Since then, Relevance Ventures is believed to be the only native-owned independent venture capital firm in the country. Cameron has also expanded to include his brother, Dean, as a partner. Together, they are based out of Nashville, Tennessee. What Relevance Ventures does is find entrepreneurs working on the latest and greatest ideas in the fields of financial technology and health and wellness. If they find a company they like, they provide funding and private equity to get its wheels off the ground. To be perfectly honest, there are not a lot of Native people engaged in traditional venture capital. We've been um, trying to elevate this issue once we noticed it. Um, shame on us for not noticing it sooner, frankly. They provided initial money to a company called Sunbasket. It is an organic meal delivery service based out of San Jose, California, that now makes $300 million in revenue. So how does Relevance Ventures get the money to invest into companies? They raise it. And then now, of course, we're on our fourth fund, which is $75 million. Relevance Ventures says it is now prioritizing later stage investing. Instead of being the first money in, they are now the second, third, or fourth. My advice is always, hey, if you, you have that burning desire inside, and, and entrepreneurs do, and it's hard to extinguish, uh, you know, you, you really need to let it, let it out. The brothers are working to reach more companies. So far, they've invested in 16 startups, including Karoo, which allows employers to send curated boxes of snacks and small gifts to their employees. They've also invested in The Good Patch, which are wearable wellness patches that can help people with energy or stress relief. Cameron and Dean say they also hope to meet more Native entrepreneurs to make venture capital and private equity accessible to them.
In Albuquerque, Aliyah Chavez, Indian Country Today. This year marks the 500th anniversary of Mexican independence, and this year the focus is on the country's indigenous cultures. Despite the loss of indigenous lives in the epic event five centuries ago, much still remains of that civilization. Mexico City sits on top of a great indigenous civilization that was sophisticated. The city's center is dedicated to commerce, much like it was centuries ago. Vendors lay out wares on blankets or in stalls, just as they would have done in 1521. Archaeologist Esteban Myron says indigenous people continue to exist despite the idea that they are vanishing people. This discourse that we are a mixture of the Hispanic and Mesoamerican worlds is really a way of rendering invisible how much has survived and the resistance of the peoples who have struggled for 500 years to continue to exist. And those are the headlines from Indian Country Today. I'm Patty Thalonghunva. Novelists write books of fiction, creating characters and, and plots that may be imaginary or based on real events. We'll talk with three Native American writers about what it takes to create those worlds. One of the first sentences that most of us say is, tell me a story. And for indigenous people, telling stories is a way to entertain, to document, and to pass on culture and history. Today, we're joined by indigenous novelists, Erica Wirth, David Wyden, and Kelly Jo Ford. Ford's debut, Crooked Hallelujah, follows a Cherokee mother and daughter who moved from their nation in 1980s North Texas to try to start a better life that this new life hits some snags. Welcome, Kelly Jo. Thank you so much. It's an honor to be here with, with you and David and Erica. And Wyden's first offering, Winter Counts, is a thriller about a vigilante tracking down the source of a heroin on the Rosebud Reservation. His newest book, Wounded Horse, released in 2023, is already generating lots of buzz. So good you could join us, David. It's my pleasure to be here. Thank you. And Worth's first novel, Crazy Horse's Girlfriend, chronicles the adventures of a sharp-tongued 16-year-old Native American girl as she tries to avoid teen pregnancy like the plague. Welcome to the show, Erica. Thank you so much for having me. Well, these are some really great um, novels. And uh, I want to start, David, with a question about how Natives fit into the publishing industry. Well, you know, Natives have often been shut out of the publishing industry for a long time, but I think things are changing right now. I think the industry is opening up and opening up to lots of different types of novels. We've got traditional uh, literary fiction, we've got genre works, we've got all YA novels, we've got all sorts of things happening. So natives have to just tell our stories. And if we do so, I think that some doors will begin to open up for us. Kelly Jo. I agree. I feel like it's it's a ripe time. I think that um, we've been out there for a really long time, and finally, I think readers are starting to demand to demand that that publishers um, open up their doors. And and like David said, it's just you know you've got um, works of literary realism coming out. Um, often you've got amazing works of, of crime fiction, horror fiction. Um, it's just. It, it's, it feels like a special time, and I'm really hoping that, that publishing is truly changing right now. And Erica? Yeah, I think, um, obviously, you know, I'm a fiction writer first, but secondarily, um, I'm a person who's written tirelessly about this because I just, I know some folks want it to be one guy speaking for everybody, but I just find that really boring, and I don't think it's good for Indian country, and I, I love what's happening now, and I've written countless articles on, you know, you know, what Cherokee citizens are doing. I mean, there just is an explosion there alone. I've done articles on speculative literature, which is finally blowing up crime literature. And I feel like it's so beautiful to see unenrolled Indians, Indians from different tribes, you know, 
um, black natives, so many different natives, like, you know, speaking forward finally, you know? Well, and this exciting time extends beyond the printed word because all of a sudden, now you have the option of getting picked up and being made into a television show. Yes. Start with you, Eric. Erica. I saw that. I'm so sorry to interrupt. I, I saw that this morning, someone talking about reservation dogs and how, you know, Native Americans are having a moment and all these natives were like, please let it not just be a moment. Please let it be a situation where at least all the demographics in this country have at least a small, diverse representation of who we are out there. And Kelly. Yeah, it's so good to see, you know, I do, I feel like we were just, we're starved for rep representation. Um, and so to see all the, the joy um, surrounding uh, reservation dogs and not just reservation dogs, Rutherford Falls too. And there, there's other great stuff out there in the works. Um, you know, like there was this moment in Reservation Dogs where I, I had to turn on closed captioning and go back when the guy bought the meat pie and he walked away and he said, what the, I had never seen that on television and I get chills now thinking about it. I teared up and I rewound it and I was sharing it with friends like, look at this, look at this. And that shows you one simple word, you know, we, we're starved for it and, and we've got, um, we, we've got brilliant artists ready and, and working. And so hopefully it's just going to get better. I feel optimistic. David. Well, I just want to echo what Kelly said. Rutherford Falls, I think is one of the funniest shows in a long time. But Reservation Dogs is amazing. I just watched that episode last night. It is fantastic. Um, and, and there's a lot in the pipeline as well. Winter Counts is right now uh, being um, talked about uh, by a film production company. And, you know, there's a lot of stuff that's bubbling under. We're going to see more and more. I think this is our time and we need to be ready to take advantage of it. You know, it's time to tell the native story to everyone. It, you know, one part of that, and maybe we'll start with Kelly this time, is um, so much of the story is about writing for indigenous people, but so much of the American story that's missing is writing for people who have never heard this before. H how important is that balance? And start with Kelly. Sure. I don't know. I think it's a really interesting question. I'm not sure I have um, have, have a great answer for that balance, because I think sometimes when we write our stories and we center ourselves, people from outside of our communities might might feel a little uneasy and might feel like, hey, that doesn't look like kind of like that's not a native story that that's not the native story I came here for, you know, um, because they have a certain image in mind because representation has been so poor in mainstream publishing and, and television and, and film. Um, but but for me personally, I want a wide audience. I want to sell books. That's that feels good, you know, to help help feed my family through my art. Um, but but what really means the most to me is to hear from people back home to say, like, we we love seeing ourselves and we've never seen seen this story, but it feels right in some way. Like so so when I'm thinking about that balance, that's certainly like where um, where my heart is on that side of the equation. I see you nodding, David. <laughs> well, you know, I, I just want to say that it is a balance. You know, I, I too, I have gotten uh, hundreds of fan letters from people, non-natives, saying, we didn't know about this. We, you know, when I read your book, Winter Counts, I didn't know that the criminal justice system is broken on many reservations. I didn't know about boarding schools. I didn't know about all this stuff. And, you know, thank you for enlightening me. And, and I'm, I'm glad, I'm so thrilled that Winter Counts is having a positive effect on the, you know, society at large. But I most treasure the dozens and dozens of letters and videos that I've gotten from people back from my nation, Lakota country. And they've said, finally, I, see, I feel seen. You know, I feel represented. Thank you for writing about our nation. So, so it is a balance, and I'm I'm really happy to appeal to both. And Erica, yeah, I think the more that there's diversity, the less pressure there is on one show or one writer to represent everybody, and then it just blands it out. And I I think ironically, when you have writers like Sherry Moraga and Rebecca Roanhorse in the writers' room, and that's just two Sterling Harjo. The 1491s are now all writing um, for television. When you have that, it actually makes it more accessible because they're good at what they do and they're storytellers and they're funny and they're sharp and they're able to make these stories sing. And that's how it's more accessible by hiring writers who know what they're talking about and who are just good at what they do. 
I want to pick up on a point you made early, uh, Erica, and that is um, about diversity within Indian country. And I think back to the work, say, of Darcy McNichol, and he was writing a, a long time ago about mixed bloods and people that you don't think of on reservation communities. And yet that kind of disappeared for a long time, where it was this one type of Native person. Yeah, it's funny. It seems to me like, for, gosh, you know, and I've written, I know this is kind of makes me into a boring scholar, but I've written on these waves of Native American literature because it became fascinating to me to see the trends. And then one of the things that came forward for me was to realize that, you know, poets and fiction writers have been writing, you know, Native poets and fiction writers alongside their white American contemporaries for as long as American, white American writers have been writing. And I think, you know, there's just always going to be this desire, right, to bland us out into one binary kind of thing, because it's just, it's more palatable, it's easier. But in the end, you know, it, it's not fun, it's not interesting. And it's just, again, I have to reiterate, I don't think it's good for us. I want to see reservation dogs, and I want to see urban Indian dogs too, you know, or cats, you know, would be fine. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I think that's what I want to see. I mean, I'm very urban. And I think, the, again, like the more diverse it becomes, the less pressure there is on just one narrative. It's funny, I grew up on a reservation, but I still had to look up backstrap. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. David. Well, I'll, again, I'll just echo, you know, what Erica has said, you know, there are almost 600 native nations in America, and we all have different cultures and traditions and stories. And so I love the fact that there are all different types of stories being told right now. I don't want to just talk about my book, but in Winter Counts, I write about being an Ayeska, which is, again, a mixed, a mixed blood person. My friend Tommy Orange is writing about the urban Indian experience. You know, we're all telling different stories from different perspectives. And that, in my view, is just such a, a valuable and wonderful thing that's happening right now. And Kelly. Sure. I, I mean, I, I, I don't know. I can feel like I just want to cheer along everything they say. Um, but and, and I think one important part of the diversity um, and, and the, uh, the idea that we have many more than just sort of like one native writer who's, who's getting a lot of attention in publishing books is the more that we do that, the more we're able to tell our stories um, as, as we feel, feel true to our experiences and the less pressure each, each story has. A lot of times kind of going back to the earlier question, um, a white audience wants to come to our stories and sort of get like a history lesson and, it, you know, and, um, an anthropological lesson and and you know and and sometimes that's an important part of the stories we tell but the the more that um we're able to get our stories out there the less weight we have to carry to kind of like explain ourselves with every story we can just have characters like living lives um and i think that's important and i think that young artists should be able to look to those works and and and, and feel inspired and empowered to 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 create their works well, this round table has been so much fun and it went way too fast. So thank you all three for uh, joining us today. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. When we come back, we'll get a final wrap up of how indigenous athletes performed at the Olympic games. This year, a record number of indigenous athletes qualified for and then competed in the Summer Olympics. Mohawks, Native Hawaiians, Maori, Aboriginals, all traveled to Tokyo to compete in Olympics that was like no other. Due to the coronavirus pandemic, family and friends were not allowed to be in the stands cheering on the athletes. How did that affect them or did it? Dan Ninnam is a freelance journalist who writes about indigenous athletes for IndianSports.com. And he also has a column in The Circle, which is published in Minneapolis, Minnesota. He joins us now to give a breakdown about how these indigenous athletes competed at the games. Welcome, Dan. Segun. Bonjour. Let, let's start with the big picture, uh, kind of the medal count for uh, native indigenous athletes. I'm sorry, say that again? What was kind of the big picture for indigenous athletes in terms of medals and participation? It really is. It's the uh, it's the elite. It's the ultimate, the Olympics. 
there's a number of international competition, but this is the, the Olympics. And how, how did indigenous athletes perform? They did very well. There were a number, uh, we didn't have any in, in the United States that were represented. Uh, we have had one in Canada, Jillian Ware. I understand she placed 11th in her, in her, in her sport. And, uh, but we uh, extended the areas of the indigenous athletes uh, throughout the Americas from North, Central to South America and, and Team Australia. They had headlines of, of 16 indigenous athletes that were attending and, and that kind of got the light bulb going up uh, thinking about there must be others. So I found out New Zealand, they had 33 indigenous, indigenous athletes that participated. One U.S. athlete that was um, in the games was in surfing and uh, a native Hawaiian. And um, what was interesting, I thought, is not only she was given permission to use the Hawaiian flag um, as part of her ceremony instead of just the U.S. flag. And uh, pardon that uh, mistake. Yes, we had an ethnic, ethnic Hawaiian, Carissa Moore. She was a gold medalist in, the, in surfing. Surfing was introduced into this Olympics. This was the first time that it was offered. And, and it's interesting that the uh, surfing has indigenous origins as well to the native people. Some of the uh, athletes that competed are very young. Um, that probably augurs well for the future for indigenous athletes. Uh, the future is, is very good. I understand with some of the countries that three out of four of the athletes are under age 25, if not the indigenous population. So there is a, a potential. I've been interested in, in analyzing how we can get more indigenous athletes to go to the Olympics, to compete. Uh, so I've been talking to a number of country sport federations of what they're doing and, and what we can do here in the, in the States as well. What, one sport that I've always been interested in and I've always thought it'd be one to take to tribal communities is rugby and particularly the New Zealand All Blacks team and especially the women. Um, They've really indigenized the sport in so many ways. They have indigenized the sport. Uh, we have Indian football as, as one of our traditional games in, in many of our, our North American societies. And I think of, of they call uh, soccer football. They have rugby. They have, they have uh, evolved rugby into what they call a seven. So that's seven on the side. And, and they have, uh, I understand, two seven-minute periods for for halves that they they play. So it's a shorter duration, a shorter, uh, less number of people on a side, and and the uh, the rugby game for the women has been going on for about twenty years now. And you think that's such a we're in our infancy an international competition with, with the women. And New Zealand, New Zealand Rugby Sevens, they are the gold medalists. So that, that's also exciting. It was great to see them actually do a celebratory haka after the conclusion of their gold medal. Yes, and also in the story of Indian country today, I addressed uh, recently that that the men's haka is different than the women's. And in the men's, if you can visualize, uh, so many people have, have seen the haka on YouTube and, and live on TV as well. But the men, I understand it's a, a pre-battle ritual and they stick their tongue out, they're more in a, a crowd squatted position. Whereas the women, the women's haka is keyed on the power of women and the women do not stick their tongues out and they're in more of an upright position. But looking at the, the women's haka, you know, it's for a purpose. 
and the opposition, I'm sure they, they are aware of what's happening. We have less than a minute left, Dan, but I wanted to just ask, what's most exciting about international competition coming up for Indigenous athletes? It's, it's so exciting to, to see um, everyone competing with everybody else. You key on the cultural, the Indigenous, the ethnic diversity, everyone coming together. I think of one of the countries, they talk about one team and one spirit. And I think of, of that as, as for the whole Olympics, uh, everyone can look as one team for the 10 days of competition that they're looking at, even though they're in separate teams and countries, of course, but everyone coming together and, and, and such a, a new world order, so to speak, of what we have with living with the pandemic. And we're continuing as everyone is, uh, making our adaptations and accommodations to it. But everyone coming together as one in one spirit. One spirit. Thank you so much, Dan. Thank you. And that's a slice of our indigenous world. Thank you for watching. For all the latest news, go to IndianCountryToday.com. I'm Mark Trahan. Sometimes you got to take a stand Just because you know you can oh, You got to run, you got to run This is Indian Country Today.